So everybody has heard about uh, linear regression in high school, of course. You know, how boring can that be? Um, but we will revisit it and uh, give it, well, a twist or two today and more on Wednesday. Yeah? So first, uh, you know, generically, what is regression about? Uh, in classification, we have been predicting the class label. Um, we have been predicting categories. Here we're trying to predict numbers. So in regression, we try to res predict a response or sometimes this is called a dependent variable. which typically is a response on the real line or uh, even multiple responses or a vector of reals. From known explanatory variables or if we say we are trying to predict the dependent variable, we would say that we would try to predict it based on independent variables. Or this is sometimes called features. Or regressors. And because this has been used and invented in so many fields, it has accordingly many names. Typical applications are, well, to interpolate, or if you're really courageous, to extrapolate. or to predict. So different fields here use different names. Yeah? So um, people from uh, the economic sciences, they talk about prediction. Uh, more careful people talk about extrapolation. Uh, statisticians would talk about estimation um, of that response. Or we can try and estimate parameters. I'll give an example in a moment. It's especially important here to get also an uncertainty estimate on those parameters. Or sometimes this is used for interpretation. to find if I have very many possible attributes, which ones are truly useful in explaining a dependent variable. So to determine the most influential explanatory variables. And then there are also statistical hypothesis tests to decide uh, if we should include a variable or not, if it only marginally uh, improves our fit. <coughs> so this characterization is uh, here valid for all kinds of regression, um, but we're going to discuss linear regression specifically. Linear regression means that it's linear in the parameters. But it can be nonlinear in the explanatory variables. That's important to keep in mind. Now, I want to give you two examples. Um, 
So example one is the high school example. We have some explanatory variable x. Here just I'm using just a single one. We have a response y. We have a we have a couple of measurements and we try to get the best possible fit here. <coughs> or we can have two explanatory variables. We can have a response and then we can have measurements that I'm trying to sketch here, you know, measurements in the plane. And then our prediction will be, well, a surface. Example two is maybe, you know, and that's the, the bread and butter use. Uh, I'll give you an example two to make it a bit more Colorful. Um, this is, and this was in the group of Ulrich Platt. He is one of, I think he's one of the founders of this Institute for Environmental Physics. And uh, I'm not sure now, but I think it dates back to the 60s. And uh, it was truly visionary at the time, you know, when nobody was worried about you know, climate change or anything like that. Uh, to, to create an institute for environmental physics, and, and they did. And he, in particular, has been an expert in remote sensing and uh, fascinating uh, person, by the way. So he's, uh, he's really good at math. He's really good at building instruments, so, you know, with soldering and uh, screwdriver and all that. And then he uh, manages to talk to people to convince them to put it on a satellite or in a plane, which is always really expensive. Yeah? And he also has a really broad interest. Uh, so a few years ago, I uh, organized a seminar with him where we were discussing uh, the risks of artificial intelligence and if the singularity will happen or not. Yeah? So um, very brilliant mind, I think. And uh, you can sometimes, you know, you, will see, you might see him on your way to Menza. Um, now, he has been uh, developing over a number of years this differential optical absorption spectroscopy, or uh, DOAS for short. And these are the kind of measurements uh, they're making. They take an atmospheric spectrum. And uh, atmospheric spectra, well, they have the interesting peaks, but then they also have a sort of uh, very diffuse background from scattering or for clouds and so on. And they have refused, uh, they have uh, uh, removed this uh, low these low changes, uh, so the slow variation in the spectrum, essentially by high-pass filtering. Uh, then they have similarly high-pass filtered uh, the spectra of interesting trace gases. So you hear, you see here, there's ozone, um, there's nitric oxide, there's sulfur oxide. I forgot what this one is. Formic acid, something. Okay, don't quote me on this. Um, so this would be um, the response Y. These are our explanatory variables, x. And now we are trying uh, to interpret y in terms of x. And in doing so, we get out some mixture coefficients, uh, which are the ones of interest uh, that will tell us actually how much ozone was in there, how much nitric oxide was in there, and so on. And, and then uh, a residual epsilon. So I can say that if we just look at uh, a single, so from left to right here are the spectral frequencies. And I can say that for, um, let's say, some frequency new here, um, I would have these mixing coefficients, which I'm call calling beta transpose, uh, times uh, what these various spectra look like at that frequency plus a residual. Now, nu here was the frequency. And uh, the crucial thing is that beta is the same across all. Or we're trying to use all of these measurements jointly to estimate these mixing coefficients uh, to determine you know, just how much ozone was there in that measurement. And this particular spectrum was measured in Heidelberg on a sunny day, 27th of August, 1994. And uh, they've built uh, various devices. Um, so devices with a mirror, you might have uh, seen sometimes, you know, some laser on the 
standing on the roof of the you know, Institute for Environmental Physics, or they, uh, they have built cameras where they can um, just look at the chimneys of factories. So, you know, truly remotely sense, so without climbing over the, over the fence, just put the camera and see what's coming out of the chimney. It's really important. Um, or, as I said earlier, they've uh, put their instruments on satellites and uh, produced pictures like this. So here we see uh, global nitric oxide levels. And uh, we have some interesting features here. Um, so in the US, you know, the steel mills, this is a few years old. So uh, when more of the American steel mills still existed, uh, so they are close to the big lakes here. Um, China has its steel mills there. Uh, Korea has some also, as you see, and uh, Japan. Uh, Europe also produces dirt, of course. Um, this here comes from, um, I think uh, the statement was that this was from burning forests, uh, but I don't fully remember. I still remember this one here. You see a little bit of a, you know, a faint line here between Australia and uh, southern India. Uh, any ideas? Shipping, yeah. So this is where you know the really big freighters go, and uh, they uh, those really these real big f freight ships or container ships um, they essentially burn asphalt. Um, so it's the stuff which is a little bit too soft to build roads with, but uh, much too solid. I mean, at room temperature, this is a solid. You know, much too solid to use in cars and such. So they use this uh, asphalt and then heat it to a temperature where it becomes liquid. And then uh, uh, it's burned in these two-stroke two engines. No? I always found it really interesting that these container ships, uh, you know, every, every car, every decent motorbike has a four-stroke engine, uh, but the, the old mopeds, if you remember them, they have two-stroke engines. No? So these big ships, they have actually two-stroke engines, which are more efficient at that scale uh, than the four-stroke ones. <laughs> And if any one of you ever goes into engineering and improves the efficiency of such an engine by, you know, just an epsilon, this will translate to gigantic, you know, savings in fuel and emissions and so on. I'm always a little bit tempted to do that, you know, in my, in my next career. Yeah, good. Um, so this would be an example of regression. Um, let's look... Uh, Okay, before we go into the math of this, I was saying earlier up that we want to be a linear in the parameters, not necessarily in the, in the features. Uh, let's consider this example here. Uh, so the, the black points you see on the left-hand side are the measurements. And uh, well, I mean, we can do a straight line fit. We can do linear regression, but, but if we did look at the residuals, we would find a lot of correlation. Yeah, so if, if I say this is my uh, straight line, then if I look at the residuals, they will be all positive here, all negative there, all positive here. And uh, whenever you have correlation in your residuals, it shows you that you know, something is wrong with your model. Now, you know, here we can of course look at it and we can see that yeah, obviously you know, these points here do not follow uh, a straight line. And I know because I have generated the points, in fact, from a parabola, adding noise. So we, we want a quadratic fit. Um, now, let's assume that you are stuck in uh, some company. Um, they've used the same piece of software for 30 years, and your piece of software can only do linear regression. So how can you trick it into doing this quadratic regression that you need? One possibility is this. Um, you create an artificial new feature, right? I had my original features or measurements x. I had the responses y. And I can now create an artificial feature x squared. And, uh, you know, x squared, so it's, it's just my, my new feature. Uh, I call it here feature 2 equals x squared. It's a deterministic function of x. So in other words, if I look at these new explanatory variables, they will all lie on a perfect curve with no noise because it's a deterministic function. I keep the original responses, y, and I now do this linear regression in this new space. And I get uh, you know, the slope for, these, uh, for this plane, 
And if I call the slope parameters here, I can call them beta 1 and beta 2. One of them will be associated with my first feature. One of them will be associated with my second feature. And uh, well, if I consider this in the original space, the result, then overall I get this quadratic regression out. Yeah, so it's a, it's a general trick. Whenever, so as long as you stay linear in the parameters, you can create arbitrary functions of your dependent variables, of, excuse me, of your independent variables, and just use linear regression, and then you get these more flexible curves out. All right. So let's look at the regression model and the assumptions for linear regression. <coughs> the model I've already written uh, further up is we have and this response why we model as being generated from some true parameter beta. I'm putting, well, maybe a star here to say that this is the true parameter. And then I have some explanatory variables. So the probabilistic model here is that we assume that this here is a random variable. We assume that this is deterministic and exact. So by deterministic here, I just mean, you know, those are given. And by exact, I mean exact. Um, so that's an assumption which is often uh, forgotten, implicit in linear regression, the assumption that there is no measurement error in my explanatory variables at all. So if you do our high school picture here of linear regression, it means that uh, the kind of error that we're minimizing, because we assume that the measurements in x are exact, the kind of error that we're minimizing is the residual just along the y-axis. So this would be the residuals of linear regression um, or of ordinary least squares. But sometimes um, it is much more faithful to make the assumption that actually we have uncertainty both in the x and the y's. And we want to do something more like PCA. Yeah? So we, we might want to minimize the perpendicular errors, for example. Yeah? And this would be the residuals, for example, of TLS 
which is uh, total least squares. And then, of course, I can interpolate these two. So if you have some prior knowledge on how big are the errors in x and how big are the errors in y, we can interpolate between these extreme cases. Yeah, but for today, we're discussing this ordinary least squares. So the true parameter is also something deterministic or something fixed. But we see that on the right-hand side of our equation, we have a random variable. And so on the left-hand side, we also get out a random variable. OK, so let's enumerate our assumptions here. One is the explanatory variables are exact. So what I wrote up here. Then assumption number two is that uh, the expectation of our residual should be zero. Third assumption, if we don't use weighing, is that the variance of epsilon is a constant independent of x. So it means my measurement errors here are all the same. I don't have a systematic trend of um, the measurement errors being small in this area and larger in that area. If I do have such knowledge, I can include it in my modeling. Yeah? But for now, let's assume that uh, the measurement errors are the same across all of space. And statisticians have a word for this. They call this homoscedasticity. You don't really need this in your active vocabulary. I just want you, you know, to not be impressed if you ever read it. After this lecture, we will be completely unfazed by, you know, all the jargon anyone can throw at us. Good, and then um, there is the assumption uh, that the epsilon of x are iid. That's more jargon. Um, I think I mentioned this before. Uh, independent and identically distributed. So we have no spatial correlation of our residuals. Good. And as always, we will prefer to work in matrix notation because I think it makes things cleaner and is closer to the way you will actually want to implement it. And in matrix notation, I am now collecting all of my responses in a row vector, which is 1 by n. And I'm not quite sure now. So now I get into a notation problem. Yeah? On the one hand, we like to use big le or capital letters for random variables and small letters for realizations. On the other hand, we like to use capital letters for matrices and small letters for vectors. Um, 
now this here, you know, it's uh, it's not much of a matrix, but it's not a row vector either, or it's not a column vector either. So forgive me, I will use a capital letter now. Okay, I will call this here Y. And then we try and approximate this as linear combination with coefficients which I'm collecting here in this uh, vector beta transpose times x, my explanatory variables. So this is p times n, this is 1 times p, And then we still lack the residual plus epsilon, which is again a row vector one by n. Okay, let me scroll back up when you're done copying. I'm scrolling back up to this differential optical absorption spectroscopy example. As always, the pictures are in this public one document. This would be Y. Now below I gave uh, this here a capital letter. And the spectrum that we see here, those would be the entries, 500 entries in my response vector. These here would be the rows of x. So in this case here, x would be a matrix which has four rows and 500 dimensions. Mm. Yeah, and then we have epsilon which is 1 times 500. And here we're trying to find out beta transpose, just uh, four numbers that tell us um, how much ozone, how much nitric oxide and so on is in this cleaned or high-pass filtered spectrum. All right, and now we want to go about and find the parameters that will minimize the sum of squares. Or the sum of square residuals. And this is sometimes abbreviated as SSQ. So the residuals are given here by Y minus beta transpose X. And if I want to square them and sum them up, I just multiply it with the transpose of this vector. Yeah, so this thing is now, this was 1 by n, this was n by 1. So overall, I get our sum of squares, which is 1 by 1, just a scalar number. And now I want to minimize this with respect to the parameters. And this is now a calculation very much uh, like we did it when we were deriving PCA. And this is minus twice. I'm using again this numerator layout convention now. Minus twice y x transpose plus twice beta transpose x x transpose. Uh, 
And now we say that we want this to be zero. And because I want to solve with respect to beta, I'm now transposing the whole thing and bringing one of the terms on the other side. And then I find that x, x transpose beta is x, y transpose, which are called the normal equations. And formally, I can now multiply from the left with x, x transpose to the minus 1 times x, y transpose. two um, comments here, namely this thing here may be either irregular if we have too few points and too many dimensions or it may be close to being irregular. And then my whole estimate is going to be unstable. And this is why we'll spend a lot of time on Wednesday talking about um, how to well, deal with those situations. And this is where this term regularization comes from, because we're going to try and make this matrix less irregular or more regular, hence regularization. All right, so the parameter estimate that we find. We see here that it is a linear function of y. And if we go back to the stochastic model, then y was a random variable the x were deterministic, and beta is again going to be a random variable. We can use this estimated parameter to obtain a prediction. We're going to call this prediction y hat. So statisticians often put a hat on the quantity they try to estimate. So this is beta transpose times x. And then we look up what was beta transpose. So we find that this is y x transpose x x transpose to the minus 1 times x. Or this is again a deterministic matrix, which we can abbreviate and just call it h, which statisticians call the half matrix. Why the hat matrix? Well, because it puts the hat on the y. Yeah? So on the right-hand side, we have the y. We multiply it with the hat matrix, and then we get out a y hat. So this thing here is H, the hat matrix. All right, and then we, for completeness, we can also look at the residuals. This would be y minus y hat, or y times 1 minus, the, here this is the identity matrix minus the hat matrix. 
gut zu Ende. In stochastic terms, what we have here is a random variable. What we have there is just some deterministic matrix. You know, I call it A or whatever. And then my beta is again going to be a random variable. And that means we can look at the distribution of this random variable. And we will do so um, soon. Um, just a final thing now for this hour. Um, do you have an intuition for you know, when this xx transpose will be close to being irregular? So when is this matrix uh, becoming numerically unstable uh, when we try and solve this system of equations? You remember that uh, xx transpose, it's up to normalization. This is our empirical estimate of the covariance matrix. So I can ask if I have x1, x2, what would be an unstable configuration of my measurements? Or what would my measurements look like so as to make estimation difficult? So let's say I would like an example which is benign, and I would like an example which is malign, um, in the sense that xx transposed to the minus 1 is unstable. So the thing is that, that here, um, you see, if, if my data are distributed like this, um, I get two large. So if I try to do PCA of this, I will get two large eigenvalues. So if I uh, invert it, um, well, I divide one by a large number, and nothing crazy is going to happen. But um, you did mention the right things. So if my if my measurements are on a line or close to a line, then I will have one large eigenvalue, but one tiny, tiny one. And if I now invert, so it means I divide one by a tiny, tiny number, then things can blow up. Yeah. Um, so the, the interesting thing is that, that you see, I uh, in this kind of diagram here, I don't need to look at the responses at all. It only, so this question of being well posed or not, only depends on the explanatory variables. In the left is a good case. So I will be able to, I want to estimate two parameters, right? Um, so in the left hand side, I can estimate both parameters with reasonable accuracy. On the right hand side, um, I will have uh, some uncertainty. I can maybe you know make it even clearer if I take uh, another malign example. Uh, let's say my points are approximately on this line. So here I think we all agree it's easy to measure the slope in x1 because my measurements are nicely spaced. But in x2, how how should I measure a slope? Uh, I uh, I have little support for drawing any conclusions. So here I would have a good accuracy on beta 1 and a poor accuracy on beta 2. And uh, here it's the same thing, except that, uh, uh, well, now my estimates of beta 1 and beta 2 will be very highly correlated. Uh, so this is just as bad as that one, but this example here is maybe easier to, to explain. Okay, um, Let me try and make, uh, you know, add one more dimension to this plot to make it clearer. Um, so we have x1, we have x2, 
And now we have um, this row of measurements. And here we have y. And now we have this row of measurements. And I'm inventing some uh, measurements here. Let's say that overall we have uh, you know, things uh, increase as I move to the right. And I'm now supposed to fit a two-dimensional plane to these measurements. And the slope of my plane will be very well determined along the dimension along which the points are spread, but will be very poorly determined in the, in the opposite direction. Um, so the question was, can I not just to zoom into the x2 axis um, until things are um, perfectly fine there? Um, I have now assumed that uh, the units are somehow meaningful. Yeah? So for example, I assume that, um, let's say, both x1 and x2 are measured in units of meters. And uh, I assume that these are the meaningful units for both. Yeah? And then all things being equal, um, I will have more uncertainty in beta 2 than in beta 1. More questions? All right, yeah, so uh, we see it in the formula that here the, the question of ill postness or not all depends on this uh, x, x transpose to the minus 1. So it does not depend on uh, the actual measurements or on the actual responses y. OK, so we take a break. And after the break, we will look at this distribution of this parameter that we've just estimated. <laughs>